Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, good to be here. We're in a series of lessons um, focused on the book Around the Bible in 80 Days. And we are now on days 30 to 32, which brings us to Act 3. Remember, we've talked about how uh, the drama of Scripture, the, the plot of the story of God, that plot, I have, and I'm not unique in this way. I'm not the only one who does this, so it's not, not anything I've invented necessarily. Um, but I have suggested that the plot comes in five acts. If you think about a, you go into the theater, a play, you know, you get three acts or four acts, whatever it is. Well, I think the drama of scripture is helpfully seen in five acts. That's not the only way to see it, but for me, it's the most helpful way. So the first act that we spent the first 13 days on in the, the book uh, was creation. Talking about creation and its degeneration, you might say. And yet, though it degenerates, God is still pursuing humanity. God is still interested in humanity. God is still gracing humanity. God doesn't give up on humanity, even in their sin. Uh, and humanity, nevertheless, degenerates from the sin of Adam and Eve to the murder of Abel to the flood, where every thought is wicked, right? And then to Babel. And that's the story of creation. But God still doesn't give up on humanity. God still pursues humanity. And that brings us to Act 2, where God calls Abraham. And in the calling of Abraham, we have a, a renewal of God's intent in creation. Because when he calls Abraham, he basically says to Abraham, uh, I'm gonna, you're going to be my new Adam. I'm going to create Israel out of you. I'm going to create a people out of you, a nation out of you. And that nation will be fruitful and multiply, to use the language of the creation. And they will fill the land with my glory, right? And I will give them a land, just like in the creation, God gave male and female the land and blessed them and uh, invited them to participate in the mission of God. And so Israel is invited to participate in the mission of God in a new Eden with a new Adam, basically. But the same sort of degeneration takes place. As we saw last week with the prophets, Israel became a covenant breaker. And they ignored the poor, and they treated them unjustly. And oppression and immorality and idolatry filled the land. Instead of the glory of God filling the land, they filled it with, with brokenness. But the last prophet, Malachi, said somebody else was coming, that the Lord would come to his temple again. And that's the next act of the story, is the Lord comes to the temple again. And that's the story of Jesus. And before that Lord comes to the temple again, we have John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist is the messenger that comes before the Lord to prepare the way of the Lord. But Act 3 begins with the, um, with the introduction of the Messiah. So Act 1 is creation. Act 2 is the story of Israel, Abraham. And Act 3 now is the Messiah, the Christ. And that's where we want to begin tonight. We'll begin at the beginning of that story. And I think one of the most significant things that comes to light, you might say, in the beginning of this story, is the triune nature of God. I don't think it's all that clear from the Hebrew scriptures that God is communal in character, um, or at least certainly not as clear in terms of God as triune, three-personed, whatever language you want to call that. But what happens in the incarnation of God, in the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, is a revelation, it's a self-disclosure of God's own life. We see God in more communal terms, in terms of 
God's own self, right? Not just in terms of God being in community with us, but within God's own self, there is communion. And you go back to the very first day when we talked about why did God create? God didn't create because God was lonely, because God is already community. God is already in love, right? Jesus prayed in John 17 that before the creation of the world, you loved me. We were always, we, we were enjoying the love even before the creation. And so the loving communion of God is not lonely. It's not bored. Um, but it is loving. And because God loves, God creates. But what is disclosed in the third act is that this, this communion is disclosed in a concrete way by the coming of the word in the flesh. And that's kind of where we want to put our fingers down for a moment, settle into and think about that. I don't know what to call it. Some might call it offensive. Some might call it puzzling. Some might call it just obscure. But that word Trinity, right? when we talk about Trinity, what are we talking about? Well, hopefully in our liturgy, in our worship, in our songs, we are doing Trinity all the time. We're just not calling it Trinity. When we call Jesus Lord, when we talk about the incarnation at Christmas, when we talk about the pouring out of the Spirit at Pentecost, uh, when we sing songs addressed to Jesus, or we call Jesus, you know, our God, we're doing Trinity in some sense. We're not calling it that, but we're doing that God is a communal being, that within God are relationships of what we have named as Father, Son, and Spirit. So I want to go to a text that I think is, in my mind, one of the more helpful introductions to this triune character of God. And that's Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. Galatians 4, 1 to 7. Let's read that as our beginning tonight. <clears throat> what I am saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the time That when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba. Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think this is an astounding passage. Well, what's the most prominent word in what we read? What would you say is the most prominent word? Adoption, okay. And that goes along with the word, what? Who's adopted? What do we call them after they're adopted? Call them sons, right? Sons. Now, now some of your translations might say children. And I understand why. You know, we want to be inclusive in our language. We don't want to make it male and female, you know, we don't want to, we want to include both male and female in this language. And so some translations say children. But I think it really guts the point 
a little bit when you translate it children. Because what we're saying here is that whether you're male or female, slave or free, or uh, Jew or Gentile, you are a son, which is to say you are an heir. Right? So sonship is really critical here because the sons are the ones who inherited. Right? Who inherited the Abrahamic promise? Jews. Right? Women did not inherit. Typically, Gentiles did not inherit the promise to, to Abraham, and slaves did not inherit, typically. But the point here is that we are all sons, even the women, right, are sons. That is, they're heirs. They are people who inherit, right? And this is connected to the one whom God sent. Who did he send? His son, right? His son, in which both male and female are found, right, in the son. And um, so when we're thinking about that language of son, it's really important we keep that. Even if we translate it children, we still need to make sure we, we highlight the sense of inheritance that belongs to all. But let's look at the triune character of this. Let's, let me just kind of lay this out for a moment. We have creation as act one. Israel is Act 2, Christ is Act 3, the church is Act 4, and um, the new creation is Act 5, right? Um, when we think about the work of creation, we can say God created, right? And then God elected Israel, initiated Israel. But when we're thinking about Christ, what we have is this language of God sending the Son. Sending the Son. We're going to get more into that in just a moment. But this is not the only one God sends, right? Who else does God send? God sends the Spirit. And so we can think about God sending the Spirit. Which we would call Pentecost. Right? That God sends the Spirit. And so already in this very short text, we have a kind of a the threefold movement of God, right? Because God uh, has um, an underage child. Right? That's Israel. Israel is this underage child. But now, in sending the Son, because of our relationship to the Son, because we are in Christ and we've been baptized into Christ, now that we are in the Messiah, we are also sons, male and female, Jew and Gentile, slave and free. We are also sons. Yeah. What? You know, the Abba Father and Daddy, that is, that was popularized in the 1960s by a German scholar by the name of Jeremias. Uh, and he thought, okay, this is like Daddy. But 20 years later, he recanted. And he said, no, you know, that's not what it means. He got a lot of criticism for it because it doesn't really mean Daddy. It, it is a, a term of affection. And it's a term of relationship and intimacy, but it's not, it's not as crass as daddy, you know. Although, you know, some people can use the word daddy in a very intimate, you know, way. And, and, I'm, and I'm not going to, I'm not upset with people who do that. I mean, you know, if you want to call God daddy out of your own sense of intimacy. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to beat up on you. you know? But Abba is, is, a, is a typical um typical way of saying god i mean saying father in in the jewish world you know it is a diminutive that is it has an ending that is um diminutive that's not the right word or is it i don't remember um but you think about the the, the aramaic word or the hebrew word is 
for the like if I say my father, it's abi, because the e ending, the i on the end of it, abi is my, the e is my, so it's my father. Ab is father, abi is my father, right? But to say abba is to be a little more intimate, maybe, something like that. But yeah, but it is a good point that. And again, you're jumping way ahead of me, brother. You know, you okay? You know, you're getting way, you're getting out there. Okay, you know, just keep reeling me in, right? Um, it does speak to the intimacy. So, and I think that's the main point. John Mark, right, let's look at each of these sendings. Um, let's look at the sending of the sun. How is that described in this text? What what are the dimensions of this sending? Where, when, what? Ah, yeah. So this is uh, a human being who comes from a woman. You know, I can't help but think that Paul is alluding to the Eve story. That uh, all living comes out of Eve, right? She is the mother of all living. And so the human being, the one who becomes human here, comes out of a woman. Um, maybe even in a redemptive sense to redeem what happened in the context of Adam and Eve. Um, but also a sense of the interdependence. You know, Paul refers to the interdependence of male and female in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 11 and 12 that one is not without the other. One is not independent of the other, but all things come from God. So I, I think that there's kind of a real, there's a stress here. He didn't have to say it that way, did he? He could have just said, no, he just, God sent, sent the son. No, but born of woman. In other words, really concrete. This wasn't just a theophany. This wasn't just a mirage. It wasn't a ghosting, right? This was concretely, born of a woman with all the redemptive and theological meaning that it can be attached to saying born of a woman. So it highlights uh, the value of women, right? Not to limit the value of women, but to highlight the value of women, right? What else does it say about? Born under the law. Under the law. What does that tell us? Born under the law means what? Yeah, he's Israelite, right? He's from Israel. He's with Israel, right? Born under the law. He's going to be a law keeper, right? He he lives under the law. Uh, and I think that that's, we have to remember Jesus is a Jew. That may surprise some people. When you say Jesus is a Jew, Jesus is not a Christian. He's the Christ, but he's not a Christian. He's a Jew, right? So he was born a human being and as a Jew. One of the things I like about the Chosen series is they really picture Jesus as a Jew. He is in, involved in Jewish customs. He uses Jewish prayer language. You know, it's very, um, I think it's very heartening uh, to remember. And so, um, you know, one of the, in the history of thought, there was a time when, when Jesus was thought not so much in Jewish categories, but as something that exploded Jewish categories. But no, Jesus is born under the law. The son's born under the law. What else do, do we hear from this text? Fullness of time. Okay, there's timing has to do with this. I'm not always sure exactly what to do with that phrase. Fullness of time. Some say, well, you know, the Roman Empire had all these roads and maybe, I mean, okay. Or maybe fullness of time just simply means when God decided it was time. I don't know. But why would God decide this is time? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, we have to say, okay, in God's wisdom, God said, okay, this is the time. For whatever reason, that wisdom came into play or what made up that wisdom or what, what was the content of that wisdom. Maybe it had to do with the way the world was ordered at that time. Maybe. Maybe you would get a strong contrast between the Roman emperor and King Jesus. 
maybe. I don't know. I wish Paul would have explained that one a little bit more, fullness of time. But it just may only, it may just simply mean when time was full, when it was the right time, without telling us exactly why it was the right time. I don't think we know the why, but we didn't, we can say it was the right time. You know? What else can we say about the sun coming here? I'm sorry? Right, came to redeem. So we got purpose here. Came to redeem. In other words, this was a, the purpose of the coming is reconciling, redemptive, salvation, or in terms of gospel language, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? So uh, this is Paul's language, talking about redemption. And for him, redemption includes not just uh, what happens on the inside, in terms of forgiveness of sin. Redemption is redemption of the body. It's redemption of creation. He uses this language to talk about cosmic redemption, as well as bodily redemption, as well as we might call it soul redemption, right? Or, or the forgiveness of sins. So, yeah. Now, uh, this, is, um, this is just as a, a nice, as a neat summary as you're going to get, right? Uh, in Paul, with this triune flavor. We haven't got to the triune yet altogether. But our other reading comes from John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 and verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, with God and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten or the unique Son of God, right? Full of grace and truth. So when we're thinking about this one, what we have is one who is, I'm going to put a triangle around that and say, okay, we have one who is called the Father and one who is called the Son, the only, the unique Son, right, who comes from the bosom of the Father, chapter 1, verse 18. But this is the Lagos, or the Word, that's what I should have put up there, right? Word. The word who becomes flesh. Born of woman. Concrete, right? And so what we have is not merely a kind of a prophet. Not merely one who is sort of an angelic being. But one who was in the beginning with God. Now, when I, when I hear the language with God, I think it's helpful to kind of import a little bit from 1 John chapter 1. Because in 1 John chapter 1, it says the one who came was with the Father. In other words, when John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God, it's with the Father is kind of the, the meaning of that. And was God, which means identifies with God. That is, has identity that can be described as theos or God. Right? So the one who becomes incarnate is the same one who was with God from the beginning. Which is a, a, a statement about the incarnation of the divine in the flesh and dwells with us. Just as God, as we saw in Exodus 40, came to dwell in the temple with Israel, now God comes to dwell in the flesh with Israel. Now, the father language, let me just comment on that for just a moment, because father language is pretty rare in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, a couple of times. A lot of other more a lot of other metaphors are more dominant than father language. But why is it that we call the God of Israel in the New Testament scriptures Father? Primarily because he is the Father 
of Jesus, right? By, by the Holy Spirit. And we don't call the father mother because Jesus has a mother, right? Mary, born of woman. So has a father and a mother. And that, however that worked, which I'm not, I don't know all those intimacies and details, you know, but um, that's why we typically talk about God as father. Not, not because God is the father of Israel or God is the father in God's own self, but because God is the father of Jesus. And Jesus also has a mother. Right? Now, that doesn't mean that God is male. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. But it is a relational metaphor that Jesus uses to describe the relationship between God and himself. He is from the bosom of the Father. He's from the Father. Right? But let's turn to the third aspect here, the Trinitarian, the, where we get the triune. So we've got the God of Israel. And we have the, the Son who becomes incarnate, born of woman, under the law to redeem those under the law. What does this say about the Spirit? It's the Spirit that returned into our hearts. Where did it go? Into our hearts. Into our hearts. Notice the contrast here. Here, it was born of woman. Right? The Son is, spent, is sent, born of woman. Here, the Spirit is sent into our hearts. In other words, this is kind of empirical, objective. It's a reality outside of ourselves, right? That the incarnate Son, somebody we can see and touch and hear. Physical, yeah? physical right? Empirical, physical. Like First John 1 says, you know, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard with our own ears and seen with our own eyes and touched with our own hands. But the Spirit is different. The Spirit comes into our hearts. Right? What else does it say about the Spirit? Yeah, go ahead. But we refer to the, the Spirit of the Lord, don't we? The Spirit coming on the Lord? Yeah. yeah. I interpreted that to mean the Spirit of the Lord is how we refer to that. In other words, the Spirit came from the Christ, not from God. Ah, well, okay, think about it this way. When Jesus is in Nazareth and in Luke 4, the Spirit of the Lord says, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me, right? I think that's the Spirit of Yahweh, the Spirit of the God of Israel has anointed me. So I think that the, it's a, in that sense, it's the spirit that comes from the God of Israel, right? Now, there's another sense in which we can talk about the spirit of Christ, the spirit that comes from Christ, right? Uh, the spirit of his son. Or in Titus chapter 3, Paul says in Titus chapter 3 that he has poured out the spirit generously upon us through Jesus Christ. So it's, it's not that the Spirit comes upon us independent of Jesus, right? but through Jesus, the Spirit comes upon us. And so in that sense, you can talk about the Spirit of Christ, it seems to me. Yeah. Because, um, well, even in Acts 2, uh, he sits on the throne of David and pours out the Spirit along with the Father, right? So it's a kind of a dual action. The Father pours out the Spirit through the Son. That's one way of thinking about it. Yeah. First John. First John. What? Go ahead. I got to say it. Go say it. John, you know, had a, he must, he had supper with God more or less. Mm -hmm. About the last supper. Yeah. He never got over. Never, never got over having last supper with Jesus. Laying on his breast, right? It was a very intimate relationship between John and Jesus. That's why we call him the apostle of love, right? Yeah. There you go. I knew I shouldn't mention First John with you in the room. It just, it, we just go off that way every time I mention First John, you know, Brother Bobby. 
it's okay. I like it. I like it. I like the reminders. I do. Um, so what else? He goes into our hearts and what? What else do we hear about the spirit? Cry out. Cries out. The spirit cries. The spirit does something. Spirit doesn't just go into our hearts and become a couch potato or a spectator. Spirit comes into our hearts and creates experiences. The Spirit comes into our heart and cries and is active and voices. And voices what? Abba, Abba Father, right? So cries. Abba, which is the, um, let me put it this way. Jesus is anointed with the Spirit. Jesus is son by virgin birth. And Jesus is also anointed with the Spirit, like Luke 4, baptism, and so on. And we... The Spirit is sent upon us. The Spirit's poured out on us so that the Spirit becomes, uh, lives and dwells within our hearts and gives us the voice to say, Abba. In other words, the result of the Spirit entering our hearts is that we can, we can have the kind of intimacy with God that is no longer a slave, or underage, or under a guardian, but that we are sons, we are heirs, and we can call God Father. God becomes our Father. The Father of Jesus becomes our Father, right? Which is how we begin the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father. So we share that relationship. Now, Jesus has a unique relationship He's monogenes, he's only begotten or unique, whatever, however you might translate that. There's a uniqueness in that relationship, but there's also a shared life and a shared intimacy. That just as Jesus calls God Abba, which he did in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? When he prayed, he prayed Abba, Abba Father. We can cry Abba as well. We can have that same sort of intimacy with God uh, that the son has himself. Is there something else that we need to add to this? The spirit, it goes into our hearts. We cry, Abba. What else? Something else, maybe. Maybe I'm not remembering well. Ah, uh, yeah. We become heirs, right? So that this presence of the Spirit is inheritance. In fact, this is part of the inheritance, is that the Spirit dwells within us. Back in chapter 3 of Galatians, Paul actually says, I think it's like verse 14, chapter 3, verse 14. Let me, let me just read that, because I think that's the verse I'm thinking of. Yeah, he redeemed us. Use that language of redeem. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female. The blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Go back to Israel. Remember, this is part of that was the Abrahamic promise. That's where God begins with Israel, right? Genesis chapter 12. Paul is telling us that that promise includes this spirit coming into our hearts to cry, Abba so that we become heirs along with Christ, that we become co-heirs with Christ, and that this is the story that Israel 
it was that Israel was about, right? To inherit the promise. Jesus comes as the seed of Abraham, as Galatians 3 talks about. And to inherit the promise is to receive the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, the reason I want, you know, the, the, the act, act three, it seems to me, is a Trinitarian drama. We can call it threefold, if you like. And I've tried to picture that here for a moment. It's threefold in that the God of Israel blesses Abraham and commits to Abraham. And becomes and Israel becomes God's people. And God becomes their God. Right? So God creates a people in which God, among whom God dwells. But in the fullness of time, when time was full, when, when it was ready, God sent the Son, who is not um, inferior to God, but God sends God's own self. Because the one who was with God was also God. And God came to dwell in the flesh, not something less than God, but the Word became flesh, who was God, right? And so that's the, the second movement of the drama, which will be the whole focus of Act 3 as we watch this one who is the incarnate Son live out life in the world with Israel, right? But the third movement, which was promised by Joel and by Ezekiel, the third movement is the pouring out of the Spirit, which gives us the threefold flavor, right? the threefold understanding, which then plays out in the language of the church. The way the church describes this or talks about this, we are baptized into what? The name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? The benediction I end with every night, every, every lesson, right? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Or Paul, Paul's grammar, his very language is, is embedded with Father, Son, and Spirit. You see it in Ephesians 1. The Father elects us through the Son, and then we receive the inheritance of the Spirit, the deposit, right? the earnest, whatever way you want to translate that, that we already have a deposit of the inheritance by the indwelling of the Spirit. Or as Paul put it in Ephesians 2, verse 18, in Him, that is in Christ, we have access, which is kind of a temple kind of access. We have access to the Father by the Spirit. So this is the grammar. This is the Christian grammar, you might say. Uh, it's the way Christians talk. We talk about God and the Son and the Spirit. We talk about God acting through the Son, creating through the Son, gracing through the Son, redeeming through the Son, adopting through the Son in the power of the Spirit, by the presence of the Spirit. The Spirit is the one who is the energy, you know, the acting energy by which redemption is um, experienced by believers. Right? Because the Spirit's in our hearts crying. Spirit's in our hearts groaning. Spirit's in our hearts transforming, sanctifying, um, working. Spirits at work, right? Yeah. Paul never had a personal chance to preach or minister to me. Paul wasn't that. Mm -hmm. But yet he wrote 12 of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So what caused him to write this? And how did he write it? Yeah. Well, that, you know, the question is where's all this coming from in Paul, right? 
if he wasn't there three years of ministry, um, he may have been an onlooker somewhere. I don't know. You know, he could have been, uh, he could have been in part of the, the crowd of Pharisees, but we just don't know. Um, but, um, but where did he come from? Well, maybe the Damascus experience where he saw Jesus. But I think also the Spirit, his experience of God through the Spirit. Um, and Paul, Paul always is characterizing the Christian life as one in the Spirit. We live in the Spirit. We walk in the Spirit. We sing in the Spirit. We pray in the Spirit. We live. The Spirit is the one whom we breathe, right? Spirit is the air we breathe. And, it, and all that we do and say and become come out of that. So this is the structure of the rest of the story. We can't understand the rest of the story if we don't get this threefold um, relation down. God of Israel, or we might, the father of Jesus Christ. The God of Israel is the father of Jesus Christ who sends the son and then sends the spirit. One more thing about the spirit. Because new creation how does that factor in here? Is it just kind of, well, it's down the road, you know? We're, it's just something we hope for. It's just something that is, um, you know, just make it all worthwhile, you know? It's all down there. Ah, there you go. See, when you think about this, the, the kingdom, it's, it's, this, it's this kingdom we're talking about here, right? When Jesus comes. So, the one who is greater than the temple is here, right? New creation is present, particularly when we think about the resurrection of Jesus, firstborn from the dead, new creation. But also in the sense that the Spirit, the pouring out of the Spirit is the pouring out of the future. It's the way the future becomes present in the now. So that we are, um, we are already sanctified, but we're not yet fully, right? We are already in relationship with God, but not yet fully. Our spirits are renewed day by day, but our outer body is dying. Our bodies are not yet redeemed. But the spirit is already here. The new creation is already here. And that's why Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 16, that the rule we walk by, the very canon that we walk by, is new creation. New creation. So this is not something that is just in the distant future. But it is an operative reality among those in whom the Spirit dwells. And we are to be the witness to the new creation. Which means we should act like it is new creation, right? We're supposed to act like new creatures, not like the old creatures. We're supposed to act like new creatures. Because the Spirit dwells in us and the Spirit is the guarantor, the representative, the earnest of the new creation. Which means, takes us back to Galatians 3, right? That in Christ, there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave or free. But we are all one in Christ Jesus. Or, you know, if you're in Christ, if you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed. And if you're Abraham's seed, you are heirs of the promise. So in this moment, right here, in kind of the middle of the story, is in some sense the climax of the story. Because the one in whom new creation is found, the one in, in whom, um, to, which, to whom the new creation is bound, has come has come to work it out in the world. 
in his ministry, in his death, in his resurrection, in his ascension, in the pouring out of the Spirit, and in his presence in the church by the power of the Spirit, so that the church becomes not only a witness to, but a place of actualization of new creation. The church is supposed to look like new creation, not like out there, you know, not, not like the way we do politics or something. No, the church is supposed to look different than that. Unfortunately, we still got one foot in the old creation and one foot in the new creation. And, and, and it is not always easy to navigate how we're going to live as new creatures in this moment. And that's the struggle in the church. How do we live as new creatures when it comes to ethics? How do we live as new creatures when it comes to generosity? How do we live as new creatures when it comes to oath keeping? How do we live as new creatures when it comes to male, female? We struggle with that. Mm -hmm. We're trying to figure out how to be new creatures, how to look like new creation, not like old creation. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. God bless.